computer. And welcome this evening to Coffee with Kruger after a week's absence. Good to be back with you. And I so good to see you. I tell you, I, I, well, I go through withdrawals when I'm not with you guys for a while. I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> what you what you serve in your kool-aid I, i'm not quite sure but uh, it's so good to be back with you again tonight we're gonna have a interesting topic and those that can't be here tonight i know some are going to be watching the recording of this later it has to do with baptism of infants and we for some of us who are lutheran we take it for granted and we come out of the catholic lutheran background that's commonplace but for uh, many in the non-denom world, uh, for the some Baptists and others, uh, it is not what they practice. They practice Christianing and then uh, baptism at uh, what they call the age of accountability later, a little later on. And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about this and what the tradition of the early, early church is. So with that, let's open up with a word of prayer. Oh, Lord God, you have uh, given us every necessary means of grace by which your undeserved and unmerited goodness uh, comes into us to, Im to impart and sustain faith. Thank you for teaching us about baptism and Holy Communion. Thank you for your word, which uh, saves us. We ask, Lord, that through our time together in our study, we may have a greater appreciation of your goodness and touching lives so people may spend an eternity with you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so here we go. I'm going to share a screen, and it's just going to be a regular desktop share. And I'm going to go on over to uh, the... Um, PowerPoint, do you see it there? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'll just take it one, one slide at a time. The topic before us this evening is why are ba babies baptized? And I'm going to give you five reasons that historically babies have been baptized. And the first reason is that Christ has commanded it. When you look at the passage where Jesus gives the Great Commission. In part, it says this, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, mm -hmm. baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, the word nations in the Greek is ethnos, ethno, mm -hmm. uh, ethnic. All nations means all people groups, irrespective of their age. So it's... Uh, involves children as well as uh, older people. And so one of the primary reasons why we baptize infants and why the church has baptized infants from early on is that Christ has commanded that we make disciples of them. One way of doing that is by baptizing. Baptism is the inaugural word of God. So if you look at the word of God, the communication of God to us, you have the edible word of God. That's Holy Communion, right? Edible word of God. Yeah. The inaugural word of God usually means the beginning word of God. Usually faith is imparted in a little child to begin with uh, through baptism or later on, maybe through the word. And then baptism becomes a uh, something we're commanded to do after we believe. So either way, it can happen, and it can happen both for an adult and for an infant. A second reason is that babies need forgiveness. Some say that a baby is not held accountable for their sin until they reach a certain age where they can reason right from wrong. Yet in Psalm 51.5, David writes, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Now, the word iniquity means yeah. same as sin. Yeah. I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So from this and other passages, we 
come to see that humankind is wrapped up in something called original sin, originated with Adam and Eve. And this original sin, like a deadly cancer, spreads from parent to child. The whole human race, as a matter of fact, all of the created order is groaning in travel because it's caught up in the sin that originated with the fall of Adam and Eve from paradise, from Adam and, from uh, Garden of Eden. That original sin is not something we do. It's something we are. Mm -hmm. We are in a condition, First and Second Corinthians tells us, where our natural impulse is to run away from God, not run toward God. We don't come to Jesus. Jesus comes to us while we're running away. He's the hound dog running after us, finding us and saving us. And uh, that's what the Holy Spirit is all about. The Holy Spirit engenders faith. It comes to us and changes us. So I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And since babies are sinful, babies have a means of grace for them. Even when they uh, do not intellectually understand the word, they can receive baptism as God's grace, blessing them and giving, imparting in them a type of faith. Now, where, where, where sometimes we go wrong is we sometimes equate faith with knowledge. Of course, you want to have some knowledge about who Jesus is, they want to know the story. But even Satan knows who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. That doesn't save him, right? Nope. So faith is trusting in Jesus. Trusting in Jesus for your salvation. So let me ask you a question. You have a little baby. You put it in its mother's arms. Will the little baby feel safe? Or will it start worrying that the mother is going to drop the baby every couple of seconds? The baby automatically trusts that the mother is going to hold the baby securely in her arms. Trusting faith in a little child is the same thing. It simply trusts uh, this whole matter of, of um, Jesus' love for the baby. This goes on, I'll explain a little bit more on the next one. Uh, baptism replaces circumcision. So in the Old Testament times, God gave to Abraham a, a, a covenant that he would be their God and the Israelites would be uh, his people. And that covenant was cut. And the covenant, you really cut covenants. And so when you have a, a covenant, you would cut an animal, you cut it in half, whatever. The way this covenant was cut was through circumcision. At the eighth day of age, a, a, a male Israelite or slave or anybody who was in the household uh, of an Israelite would be circumcised. That made them part of the covenant family of Israel. And uh, it set them apart from the uncircumcised people around them. And so in the New Testament, it says, we have a New Testament now, a new covenant. New Testament means new covenant. So we don't need to do the old covenant anymore. It's surpassed by the new covenant. And what is the new covenant? Colossians 2 says this, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. So baptism becomes the counterpart to the Old Testament circumcision. And so it was very common in the early church that on the eighth day, just as when uh, a child would be circumcised, on the eighth day, they would be brought to the church, to the baptistry or wherever it would be, and they would be baptized with the family around them in the eighth day. 
and that was from uh, seen as a new covenant. You're now incorporated into the family of Christ. I'll give you a couple more pointers and then we'll open it up for some discussion. Infants can believe. I kind of mentioned this before. Well, look at this passage of Jesus in Luke chapter 18. Now they were bringing even infants, and the, the word in Greek means babies. They were bringing babies to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, because the, the people in those days didn't think highly of children at all. They didn't think highly of children at all. They went, get, let's get those kids out of here. They're creating a mess. They're making too much noise. Get them out of church. Okay. So, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, let the children, that word in Greek is a different word, but it also means tiny children. <laughs> Tiny little baby children, not half grown, tiny ones. Let these little tiny children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Till I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like one of these little tiny babies, like a child, shall not enter it. Again, we're talking about the not being a having a childish faith, but having a childlike faith. Like faith. Now, like faith means a simple trust without all the intellectual doubts that we, with our big minds, we always constantly doubting and second guessing everything. Yeah. Well, a little baby child doesn't do that. They just trust. Yeah. And that's the kind of faith the Lord says is the best kind to have. Yeah. yeah. So look at what, a, what Peter did in Acts chapter two. This was right after Pentecost. Jesus had just gone to heaven. The Holy Spirit has come the day of Pentecost. And Peter is giving this sermon. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're baptized in the name of Jesus, you're automatically baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because Jesus sums up God the Father to us, and he imparts the Holy Spirit to us. So it's, it's either way is, is okay. So I'm baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or I'm baptized in name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. So this isn't a John the Baptist baptism where, where you're repenting and hoping God will love you, but it's a power baptism. It's got the Holy Spirit in it. It's going to change lives. And so baptize in the power of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Baptism is a means of grace. It conveys a way for God to come into us. It, it says that here, that the Holy Spirit comes to us in our baptism. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and get this, your children. Everybody in the family is supposed to be baptized. Whole households were baptized. And for all who are far off, anyone whom our Lord God calls to himself. And then I'm going to give one final um, point. And that is when you look at the earliest church writings after the apostolic age and the second generation of people around the uh, third century, even some second century, uh, people like Irenaeus, Tertullian, or Origen, Cyprian. Uh, one quote from Augustine For from the infant newly born to the old man bent with age, as there is none shut out from baptism, so there is none who in baptism does not die to sin. Baptism, we die to sin, we're reborn as, as Christ follower. And so that's way back then. And those are some pointers. I'm going to open it up for questions, and then I want to talk about a couple of other things. The, the practice of the non-denoms, not to baptize, how did that ever come about? And uh, limbo. Babies not being baptized, where do they go? Okay, first of all, any questions up to this point? Kind of interesting topic, isn't it? Yes. Anybody have a, Dean, good to, good to see you, Dean. Yeah, good to see everybody here. Yeah, good to have you with us. Uh, so, uh, 
Dean is in Southern California. John is in Minnesota. Judy is in the Clovis area. And I am too right now. <laughs> and uh, the rest of you, I think, are somewhere around San Rafael. <laughs> Unless you sold your home. <coughs> okay. Any questions, comments? So, Pastor, uh, immersion, like the Baptists do, is, is not uh, wrong or anything. It's just another way to do a baptism, isn't it? So it does not matter the form of baptism. All that's required in baptism is water and the word. Right. And the word comes through the water. Uh, and Holy Spirit comes through that uh, action. Just like, in, uh, just like in Holy Communion, you receive the, the bread, you receive the cup, and as you receive it, you receive Christ. If you drop the bread, unlike what the Roman Catholics teach you, you do not drop the body of Christ. It's as you receive it, you're receiving uh, the, the, the God himself comes through that as a means, a way for his grace to enter us. A holy, um, uh, uh, so immersion, total immersion, is a really fascinating way to be baptized because it's so symbolic of being made dead to sin and alive to Christ. And I love seeing people ba being baptized. Uh, and we've done this in, in pools, like uh, Dale, you were commenting in an email earlier to me about uh, you, you, had, you witnessed that. And it is just very symbolic, but you know, baptism also means washing. And so sprinkling or washing or putting on water on a person is another part of what it means to be baptized. So it doesn't matter how you do it as long as you do it. Mm -hmm. And anybody can baptize anybody. Now, in the sake of the church where the pastors are given the privilege of publicly doing what we all get to do, proclaiming the word and administering the sacraments, uh, it, generally, the pastor or someone, uh, a leader in the church, does the baptism. But in emergencies, uh, anybody can baptize. Because it's not the person doing the baptism that makes it efficacious. It's God that makes it so. You could have somebody who doesn't believe anything of what the talking about and giving you communion and baptizing and they don't believe a word of it it's still 100 percent powerful because it's god doing it even if they don't believe it wow it doesn't rest on the faith of the pastor thank you good any other questions comments well i have been attending uh on some Sundays, a Baptist church, and they, the pastor told me I needed immersion, and I told him I was baptized, and um, he told me that it was, you know, the death, it kind of, it was, he explained it in some of those words, and I said, well, so you're saying that my first baptism didn't take and um, he said, no, not that, you know, and I said, well, I feel the spirit in me. And I think that's important, you know, that isn't that that's not necessarily when you receive the spirit, though, is it with that's baptism? Right. You do receive the Holy Spirit initially if you're baptized as an infant in baptism. Uh, so you have a baby faith. You have a start of a faith. And it's up to the family of God, especially the parents, that now to continue to have that faith grow. Yeah. And so that's why you, you do the things, Sunday school, everything else. So the faith grows and, and matures. Uh, people get in the word. They can, you know, all your life you grow. But it can be the start of faith in baptism. I and do like the fact that they call people to seek baptism. Um, in the church at uh, the sermons and everything that they do, um, 
if you know anyone hasn't been baptized and wants to talk to me and they talk about it a lot of Sundays right. not necessarily every Sunday but they do talk about it a lot of Sundays and you know that's really how it should be when you have a church we have a lot of people coming in who are not um, baptized Christians this should be common a common thing that you would be talking about we don't do too much of it in a lot of our churches because everyone who comes to church has already been baptized but yeah, when you have 10 percent of your church coming in who are made up of people who've never been there before and they've never been baptized uh, it, it, it's a, a very exciting world and i uh, remember uh, back uh, judy and emmanuel when we began some of the things there we had all these people that had not been baptized. And so we generally then have an adult instruction class if they're adults. And even if their children are going to be baptized, we train the parents how to work with their children. And so there'd be a, a series of courses. I even wrote a book, My Life in Christ. Maybe some of you have it. And it has all the, uh, the six uh, chief parts of uh, Luther's small catechism in it in a maybe a little bit more digestible way. And you can get that on Amazon if you want my life in Christ. So it's uh, something that's there. People get trained. And it's a very exciting place. And this is what I see for Trinity. I see for Trinity, a church where every week there are unbaptized people, unsaved people sitting in the pews, hearing the word of God, maybe for the first time. Right. And, and, and nothing, you take nothing for granted. You're in the smoking section of life now. You're not going to expect everyone to both behave like a 50 year 50 year seasoned Missouri Senate person. They're gonna be unchurched. They're gonna act like unchurched people. They're coming to church and you, you're gonna say what Teresa said, um, if you believe in your heart what you've heard in the sermon, be baptized, you and your family. Just like Peter said. Yeah. And then uh, you get to do that. And it, it, there's such a vitality when you have a church that begins to do that. And by the way, it can easily happen. I call it the popcorning effect. And you just need to have two, three people that catch the word of God. And they begin to tell others and they come and the others tell others. And within a short period of time, you have 20, 30 people coming in that and you don't know what to do. And pretty soon all of you are going to be sponsors for some unchurched person. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. So that's what I see. Thank you. So let's real quickly talk about how do we get to where we are with a lot of these mega churches and non denoms that do not baptize infants, but rather wait for the age of reason. And uh, this uh, came about originally through Tertullian, but more recently after the Protestant Reformation. Uh, with uh, Calvin, and uh, the age of reason had entered into society, and with it, they believed it was not reasonable that a person should be asked to be baptized when they cannot reason out their faith. And so they wait until that. And until then, uh, the families are encouraged to christen them and bring them up in Bible stories and so forth, but they should make their own decision to be baptized uh, later on. So that's become in vogue in a lot of the Made in America churches today, but it is a, a, a deviant. It's at, apart from what we find historically. Uh, it, it already back in the earliest writings, they talk about infants being baptized. And this was just something that was very common. Matter of fact, the, the fact that uh, that it's so common, it didn't even have to be referenced in scripture to say only old people get to be baptized. No, it was just understood. You know, as for me and my family, whole households being baptized, everybody, slave, free, all baptized at once. And it was understood that it was God's doing, God's grace. So 
there are those rigid, those that are hold to a rigid view in some of the Baptist churches that the only real baptism is immersion. If you aren't baptized by total immersion, it's not a real baptism. And they will want you to be rebaptized. And they want you to do it after the age of reason. Uh, now, that is not how we view scripture. Uh, baptism is God's work working in us through the water. It is not uh, the, how we do it, what form we, we do it in, but it's um, the fact that we're obedient to Christ's command. Uh, so what about babies who aren't baptized and die? What happens to them? That has been the concern from the very earliest on. It's the Roman Catholic Church that teaches that when you are baptized, your original sin is washed away. Then you have your actual sins. You go to penance for all your actual sins. No, you don't want to. Don't worry. I can eat them, but thank you. Are we over? Your place. Is somebody coming in? Is that for me? Yeah, I will. Okay. Yeah, we're leaving. Okay, I think okay, it's there, for sure. Be but before do it, let me uh, mute Dean here just a second. There we go. So we believe that when a person receives Christ, God's grace, all of our sins, actual and original, are forgiven. And so when you come to faith in Jesus, you receive what he did on the cross all sins past present and future are forgiven as you are a child of god you don't have to work for your salvation to cover the future sins that are going to still happen they've all been forgiven on account of christ and then whether you receive that through baptism receive it through the word receive it through holy communion god's grace comes to us and assures us by the power of the holy spirit that that's so the Roman Catholic Church, however, teaches something different. It teaches that only original sin has been forgiven, and the actual sins still need to be atoned for. And so you have your purgatory, you have all that other uh, penance and all, all that. Now, a baby who dies without baptism dies without a means of grace to have original sin forgiven right original sin hasn't been forgiven because there is no way that god has touched that baby's heart yet either through baptism or through the word or through anything else so they could not get themselves to say every little baby that dies every aborted fetus that dies is going to go to hell for all eternity and suffer the worst terrible things in hell when it wasn't their fault, you know, can we say, how can that happen? And so the Roman Catholic Church developed an interim state of peaceful bliss where you do not see the throne of God, but you live in, in peaceful ignorance. And it's called limbo. Have you heard of that? Have you heard mm -hmm. of limbo? It's not like purgatory where you're working your way to heaven, but it's a state where those infants who have not had a chance to be baptized go if they die before being baptized without baptism now the bible doesn't teach about that it doesn't tell us that so how do we deal with infants who die or anybody who dies without knowing jesus say somebody in some foreign country where the gospel just can't reach them right now and they die they would probably want to know about jesus if they could but they can't, they don't get a chance. What happens to them? The answer is we don't know. Not a very satisfactory answer. All we are called on is not to get an answer to every why in our life. We are called on to do the how, not the why. We are called on to make disciples of all nations. Just go do it. And God says, let me worry about those that you can't reach. I'm a, I'm a, 
a gracious God, just put it in my care. I'll do what's right because I made these people. Why would I make them just to throw them into hell? I mean, so I leave it in the hands of God and I'm perfectly content not to sit awake at night wondering what's going to happen to these people. Now, we do know if somebody rejects the message of Christ. That's another story. If they're following Satan in his ways and his schemes, then, th then that's the direction they go. They will not be part of God's holy space eternally. They will not be part of heaven eternally because they have rejected it here on earth which means now they're going to reject it after they die too. So I mean, that's that makes it very clear that we have a commission to let everybody know the story. Okay, uh, questions, comments on that second part of what I talked about? <clears throat> Pretty heavy stuff for one half hour session. So I, I do have a theory that um, when Jesus went to, when he died and he went to hell and he took the keys of death, hell and the grave seems like those keys would give him power to appear to someone who is dying or hasn't had a chance to meet Jesus yet. Cause those are the keys to the kingdom. Right. So I, that's just sort of a theory, not terribly biblical, but it sort of is because that's in the Bible. So if you interpret it that way, then there would be a chance for God, for Jesus to show his grace and to invite that soul to make that choice at that time after when they're dying or after they've already died, there would be a, like a time there that Jesus could appear. But I don't know what you think about that. So you're talking about second Peter and uh, Jude where, where he went and visited the prisons, people uh -huh. in the prison as a from the time of noah and mm -hmm. all of that uh, right and he had to preach to all the people that had died in faith but yeah. they couldn't go through jesus to get to heaven yet right this is he, where we get he descended into hell in the hell. Creed. yeah and this is part of it, jesus state of exaltation mm -hmm. uh, after uh he said it is finished and the purpose of going to hell or to the nether regions where uh, all these demonic spirits, the Nephilim and all the people of time of Noah were, and they were bound up uh, for, for the judgment day. The, the, those are the spirits he's talking to because the war that Jesus won is not just a war against sin for humans. It's a, a war to recapture the disenfranchised nations of the world that Satan felt he had, co had control over as the prince mm -hmm. of this earth. Jesus is now saying, by my death on the cross and the resurrection, I now lay claim to all the nations. And so now becomes the movement away from just Judaism to becoming a global uh, religion a faith going to the Gentiles and to all the people of the world and reclaiming that. And so there is no salvation after death. Uh, there is appointed unto man once to die, then comes the judgment. But it, it uh, Jesus did proclaim also to the spiritual world a victory over uh, Satan and the demons. So that I mean, that's what that was. So the Bible does not ever, that I know of, say you get a second chance somehow, someplace. And this is it. This world, once you die, it's over. It's too late. When Jesus comes back mm -hmm. and judgment day, you, you can't, it's too late. You can't go running around thinking, I'm going to change my mind. It comes a time, that's, and that's it. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments? The, All the, the more the, reason that the now is so important. Say that again, Teresa. All the more reason 
that our words now are so important and our witness now is so important because there's no second chance, you know, and our neighbor, our, you know, children, you know, well, I don't want to talk about, you know, religion. And I said, well, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about life. <laughs> you know? It's important uh, to, to reclaim on the part of our churches in America, the urgency. Yes. Making it the testimony that we are called on to give. Uh, and there's an urgency because people are dying every day and people may not be this close to the Lord ever again in their life. So to make that, to share that word and let the Holy Spirit do what he's going to do. And the beautiful thing is you're just throwing out seed. That's um, it. The spirit it, is the one that does the conversions. That I don't have to worry about the, the growing of that seed. I just have to do my part and just whatever it is, you know. And you can expect the harvest too. It shouldn't just be throwing seeds out. We are not just in the planting business. We're also in the harvesting business. Yes. And so it's time for Trinity to do more harvesting. We've been throwing out a lot of seed. Time to do some harvesting. And I look forward to that happening in, in the future. Well, okay, we're done for today. See you Sunday, those of you who can make it. Otherwise, I'll live stream, I'm around. <laughs> and um, you won't get me uh, doing the violin or anything that Dan did, but uh, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll probably be actually standing up. <laughs> Okay, Lord be with you. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this half hour together for a wonderful message about your means of grace and, and holy baptism. May it be something that every morning we just pinch ourselves. We say, are we a sinful being? Are we flesh and blood? Yes. Have we been baptized? Yes. Are we your child? Yes. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. See you on Sunday. Bye. Bye-bye right. now. <laughs>